by now you've heard about ChatGPT. And of course, Friedrich Nietzsche died long before AI became a thing. But Nietzsche did write about science and speculated on where it's going. And more importantly, he issued a warning to scientists. And this warning, it turns out, has become only more urgent with the development of AI. But before we can understand Nietzsche's warning to scientists, we need to do a deep dive into our own psychology. By the way, videos like these are made possible by the generous support of our patrons. Head over to Patreon if you want to support the channel and get access to over a dozen of exclusive videos that might be a bit too spicy for YouTube. Anyway, back to the video. The ascetic ideal is one of Nietzsche's most important concepts and, paradoxically, one of the least explored. The entire final third of the genealogy of morals is dedicated to it. But, in short, the ascetic ideal is that which promotes a movement away from the world, a negation of the material. And, in Nietzsche's view, that means a negation of life itself. It's his thesis in the genealogy that this ascetic ideal is the essential kernel, the foundational idea, the prime motivation behind a wide variety of human endeavors. What do we mean by this? Nietzsche finds the ascetic ideal in every aspect of culture, including art, philosophy, religion, and yes, even in science. The example of religion is the most straightforward one. In Christianity, for example, many valorized practices focus on the spiritual life, meaning that they are opposed to the material form of existence. But, of course, for Nietzsche, spiritual is merely a euphemism for life-denying. Think of a Christian monk, the prime example of what a Christian should be. His big three activities are fasting, chastity, and prayer. Fasting is all about not eating food. Chastity is all about staying away from sex. Prayer is all about not engaging with the world at all. And, of course, monks live in relative poverty. They don't chase wealth or material possessions. This mode of being, where everything reminiscent of the flesh and blood material reality that we inhabit is banished or curbed, is the consequence of an adherence to the ascetic ideal. Nietzsche's argument in the genealogy of morals is that this instinct for the immaterial, the ascetic ideal, is the result of a psychological process that mankind has subjected itself to. It's not the result of an honest and clear-headed search for God, religion, or the spiritual, it's the result of a psychological, human, material condition. The religious life of the monks and our high praise for such a mode of being are simply one expression of this ascetic ideal. It also finds expression elsewhere. For example, in art. Most infamously, Nietzsche criticized the late operas of Richard Wagner for their promotion of life denial. He directed his ire primarily at Parsifal, Wagner's final work. For Parsifal is a work of rancor, of revenge, of the most secret concoction of poisons with which to make an end of the first conditions of life. It is a bad work. The preaching of chastity remains an incitement to anti-nature. I despise anybody who does not regard Parsifal as an outrage upon morality. And of course, Nietzsche found it in philosophy also. Look no further than Schopenhauer and his explicit promotion of the ascetic, saintly way of life. To those in whom the will has turned and denied itself, this our world, which is so real, with all its suns and milky ways, is nothing. Nietzsche's grand thesis in the genealogy is that this nihilistic tendency, this world and life denial, finds its expression everywhere in modernity. In other words, it's not confined to either philosophy, art or religion. We find it even in science. All science nowadays sets out to talk man out of his present opinion of himself, as though that opinion had been nothing but a bizarre piece of conceit. Let's talk about ChatGPT again for a little bit. If Nietzsche was still alive today, what would he think about this latest development in language models and AI? It's actually not very hard to figure out. To be sure, it's a completely new technology. But its development fits a pattern that Nietzsche discerned from the beginning of modern science up until his own time. To see how ChatGPT fits into this pattern, let's begin at the start. 
The trajectory of science, or of scientific victories, as Nietzsche calls them, seems to bend towards pulling mankind away from the center of the universe. Let's be more specific. Before the advent of modern science, man had a very high opinion of himself. He was literally at the center of the universe, with the sun and all the planets and stars revolving around him. Made in the image of God and elevated above the animal, he shared in a divine spark. But soon enough, that opinion was about to change. Copernicus discovered that we don't live in the center of the universe. Literally, that the world does not revolve around us. Our planet Earth is simply one of the many planets revolving around the sun. And even worse, as we went beyond our solar system, we discovered that we live in some place called the Milky Way galaxy, where there are billions of suns with who knows how many planets, just like Earth. Worse still, it turns out that our Milky Way isn't even unique. The universe is filled with other galaxies just like ours, each in turn filled with planets and suns and moons. We went from being at the center of the universe and everything that existed to being a speck of dust in a great cosmic ocean. What's so special about that? Well, at least we're still unique creatures, right? Made in the divine image, after all. Except, not really. Darwin showed us that we are little more than animals. We share a common ancestor with all living organisms on the planet. In this worldview, humans are not special at all. They are simply animals. Sure, maybe a bit more intelligent than the rest, but hardly special in a biological sense. And even our intelligence has been belittled by science. It turns out that we're hardly the objective, cold, reasoning creatures that we think we are. Nebulous, subterranean forces guide our actions. Our emotions, it turns out, may be even more instrumental in our decision-making than our reason is. Our entire thinking is muddled with countless biases and fallacies. We don't understand probability. We rationalize things after the fact. We suffer from cognitive dissonance. These are all scientific discoveries, scientific victories even. But, as Nietzsche points out, victories over what? Earlier in the video, we talked about the ascetic ideal, vows of poverty and celibacy in religion, Wagner's Parsifal and its incitement to chastity in art, Schopenhauer and renunciation of the will in philosophy. They all go in one direction, away from the material world, and in doing so, going away from mankind. Starving our bodies through fasting, withholding the pleasures of wealth and sex, sitting on our knees in prayer or meditation, disregarding the material body completely. Moving away from the material world also involves moving away from the material body. In Christianity, only the soul remains. But what if we don't believe in the soul? What's left in that case? Nothing. This is why the ascetic ideal, taken to its logical conclusion, leads to nihilism. In fact, the terms are almost synonymous. Ascetic idealism is nihilism. This is why Nietzsche says that Christianity is a nihilistic religion, however strange that may sound at first sight. How can a religion about God and the soul and heaven and doing good to others be considered nihilistic? The ascetic ideal is how. And even worse, God may be dead, but the ascetic ideal is very much alive. It lives on in science. The nihilistic tendency in man has found a new outlet. It has moved away from religion onto science. The death of God did not mean the death of the ascetic ideal, only that it has become more insidious, less explicit. No, this modern science, mark you this well, is at times the best ally for the ascetic ideal, and for the very reason that it is the ally which is the most unconscious, most automatic, most secret, and most subterranean. There was not for a single minute any victory of science over the ascetic ideal, rather was it made stronger, that is to say, more elusive, more abstract, more insidious. The current of nihilism now hides beneath abstractions and logical thinking. The ascetic ideal now takes the form of formulas and equations, assuming a mask of objectivity. In Catholic Mass, before a Holy Communion, the faithful repeat a line from the Gospel of Matthew. It starts like this. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. I am not worthy. That is precisely the ascetic ideal in action. The ascetic ideal is that by which man belittles himself, 
makes himself unworthy. Of course, in modern science there is no such phrase or holy book to quote. But there is the Hubble telescope picture, and how it's allegedly a reminder to us that we are insignificant little specks of dust in the great cosmic ocean. So our place in the universe is not special, just a speck of dust. Our ancestry is not special, just a bunch of animals. Our mind is not even special, just a bunch of biases and rationalizations. Is our language special? When this video is released, it's still too early to tell where AI will go exactly and what it will do to us. But with the advent of large language models like ChatGPT, we do get an indication of the direction. It will probably get progressively more difficult to distinguish human-written text from AI-generated text. For now, literature seems safe. Large language models, by their very nature, are incapable of true innovation, which seems to be the mark of genuine artistic creation. ChatGPT can only imitate, it cannot create. ChatGPT could probably write a paragraph in the style of Dostoevsky, but it was trained on Dostoevsky. It cannot produce artistic genius out of thin air in the way that humans can. But it can do a good enough job for the vast majority of texts that humans need and use. And that is the interesting part. You can ask ChatGPT to write a heartfelt birthday message to your mother. It will do a good enough job. Perhaps your mom won't even notice that you didn't write it yourself. But we do tend to feel that we lose something special, the human element. Question is, will we still feel that way in 10 years, 20 years, 100 years? What about emails from your boss or work colleagues? Do you really care if these emails are written by humans or AI generated? But the overarching point here is that even our language doesn't seem so special anymore. Something that we assumed makes us uniquely human, our ability to communicate complex ideas through language, seems to be not so human after all. If a well-trained language model can replicate it to the point of being indistinguishable. In this way, AI, or rather large language models such as ChatGPT, seem to have taken away another piece of humanity. In Nietzsche's words, it has continued the pattern of science that sets out to talk man out of his present opinion of himself, as though that opinion had been nothing but a bizarre piece of conceit. Science takes something that we held to be dear and special, our place in the universe, our creation in God's image, the power of our reason, the complexity of our language, and it tells us, actually, it's not special. You're not special. It's the ascetic ideal, it's nihilism, in a new, sophisticated form. It's hard to see the future of AI going any other way, in any other direction, than talking man out of his present opinion of himself. In fact, do we even still have that high opinion of ourselves that Nietzsche says we have? Or have we already talked ourselves out of it? It was Nietzsche's project to put mankind back in the center of the universe. Physically, that's not possible. After all, Copernicus was right. Hubble was right. But if we can't be important in a physical or a biological or a cognitive or a linguistic way, then at least in a philosophical way. Nietzsche says humanity is special after all. You are special after all. Your life is special. Against the backdrop of this ever encroaching nihilism, Nietzsche puts mankind back in the driver's seat again and he proposed a mode of living where you stop belittling yourself and your value. The ultimate test of this is the eternal return. Are you living your life in such a way that you can honestly say to yourself, I want to live this life again exactly as it is and will be, again and again for all eternity? In a way, it's the most anti-scientific question of all. But perhaps it's also the most important question, and the only one that matters, if nothing else matters. Thank you for watching.